All right. Good evening, everyone. This is Lori Charlton. It's March 28th, 2022. And I want to welcome everyone to the board of finance budget hearing. I'll call the meeting to order and uh, ask that we please all rise and feel free to unmute yourselves while our colleague, Mr. Testani leads us in the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, of the United States, States, States of America. And to, and to the, the Republic, Republic which it stands, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Testani. To the members of the public, uh, first, I want to thank everyone who's taken time over the past several weeks to write to this board with their thoughts about the budget. I also want to thank those individuals who attended the public budget hearing this past Saturday. It was really gratifying to be able to gather in person and see our community come together and engage in this process. So thank you again. For those individuals who dialed in or joined us on the WebEx tonight, please know that you are muted and will not be heard by board members and there will be no live public comment this evening. I encourage, uh, continue to encourage residents to email your comments to the board at the following email address, bof at fairfieldct.org. And for those who do so, please remember to include your name and address as you would with live public testimony. As it relates to tonight's agenda, uh, this evening is an opportunity for the board to ask follow-up questions on the budget to the department heads and town and education, town and education administration officials prior to our upcoming vote this Thursday, March 31st. Um, our board members have uh, asked for additional information throughout the process, both before and during meetings, and most of that information has been provided and posted as meeting backup for a number of our previous meetings. But we do have a few open items and some follow ups and other new questions that board members want additional clarification on. And so we'll cover those tonight. Aside from the follow up questions tonight, we have our public executive session. That's an opportunity for a more open dialogue and uh, for board members to discuss their views on this budget as individuals and to listen to the same from colleagues. We'll spend time doing that after the follow up with department heads. Uh, to the board members, I'd like to propose several changes in to tonight's agenda. One of the topics on the agenda, part of item four, relates to the Emergency Communication Center. Uh, the follow-up discussion for tonight has to do with estimates in the ECC's revenue budget, uh, and specifically the subject matter relates to ongoing contract negotiations that we understand are confidential in nature. For that reason, I'd like to suggest that we change the agenda to go into executive session at the beginning of item four and cover that topic so that we can then continue uninterrupted with the remainder of the agenda through to the end of our budget deliberations. Um, then once we come out of executive session, I suggest that we go to department 4030 police and that way we can let the chief and the deputy chief who are also uh, covering the ECC go on their way. Um, the third change is related to questions on the education budget from one of our board members that were requested after the agenda was issued. So I'd like to add those topics to item four after the discussion of dividend and interest income. So. Um, I think Madam Chair, if I can interject, I think they have to be voted on I'm, i don't want to interrupt yes. mr walsh there sorry yep. Jim. And i am i'm going to make a motion uh to change the agenda to um move discussion of department 4150 emergency communication center to the first topic under item four to be discussed in executive session followed by department 4030 police and then to add departments 8010 Board of Education and 2531 Private School Bus Transportation as the last topics under item four after dividend and interest income. Can I have a second? Mr. DeWitt, all in favor? Uh, Mr. Testani, Mr. Curley, Ms. Marmion, Mr. DeWitt, Mr. Walsh, Mr. Matola. I think, um, Mr. Stark, are you uh, 
in the meeting. Okay, and Mr. Stark, I do not see Ms. LeClaire in, so that would be, uh, so the motion passes. Thank you, everybody, appreciate it. Okay, just uh, quickly moving on to item three, response to emails. Uh, this is to address any emails or written testimony related to previous meetings that we received since we last met. We did have some additional residents write in advocating for restoration of the education budget approved by the Board of Ed, and one resident su voiced support for an efficiency study for Fairfield Public Schools. And I forwarded that letter to the chair of the Board of Ed. Okay, so with that, we'll move to item four, and I'll take a motion to move into executive session to discuss Department 4150 uh, Emergency Communication Center. Mr. DeWitt, second. Mr. Matola, okay, all in favor? Uh, okay, Mr. Tistani, Mr. Curley, Ms. Marmion, Mr. DeWitt, Mr. Walsh, Mr. Matola, Mr. Stark. Okay, Fair TV, can we move into uh, executive uh, session, please? Okay. Can I have a motion to uh, come back into the public session? Mr. DeWitt, seconded by Mr. Curley. Okay, all in favor? Okay, it is unanimous. All right, so we are um, back in session and we are on item four of the agenda, which is follow up with the departments unanimous. All right, so we are um, back in session and we are on item four of the agenda, which is follow up with the departments. Um, and so based on the revised agenda that we had voted on earlier, the next topic up for discussion is the police budget department 4030. Um, and that is Flip to my budget book from bear with me. I'm just going to get the page number. That is in our budget book on page 145. Um, so again, I want to thank the, uh, the chief for being here. I think the follow up question um, on this was related to the overtime budget. Um, and I want to thank the chief for uh, responding initially to the question. I think there were some follow ups from uh, board members, I don't know if it was Mr. Matola, Mr. Curley, I can't remember, but does anybody want to go ahead and ask a follow-up question here? Mr. Curley? Sure, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and, and thanks again, Chief, uh, for, for coming back and being with us. Um, and I appreciate the response that you provided. It, if I understood uh, correctly, um, part of the uh, explanation for the um, uh, overtime was associated with the vacancies that currently uh, that you currently have. And uh, until those vacancies are filled, you need that overtime uh, uh, funding. And I understand that. I also believe part of the explanation was that with the two additional headcount that you'll be adding, it'll take time for them to come up, uh, come on board and be fully um, a full individual contributor, right? It's going to take a while for them to come up to speed. Um, but what I'm struggling with is if if you've got the vacancies, um, you need the overtime. But if you've got the vacancies, you're not spending that budgeted salary. And if if you fill those vacancies, you won't need as much overtime. So I'm looking at those two in terms of getting my head around it. I'm looking at those two categories in total as total compensation. Right. And and it seems that you've got the you need the budgeted salary. Um, so that you can fill those vacancies, but if you don't fill them, you'll need the the overtime. And if you do fill them, you don't need the overtime or as much. So, so I'm trying to. I'm really struggling with how the sum of those two things. You'll. I don't think you'll spend the total if you add them both together because you won't have the overtime and a full um, eliminate the vacancies at the same time. So if you could just add some color there, that would be helpful. Yeah, so um, just for context, I mean, if if we had full capacity right now where we were uh, had all our vacancies filled, 
And let's say, for example, those two slots or individuals were uh, slated July 1st. Those were approved by the uh, with the Board of Finance. Those slots will not be filled or I will still be paying overtime to fill those slots until likely April of next year. So I might see a very small percentage of uh, savings for the last two or three months of FY23, if anything. Um, and I say that because everything is fluid. I, I'm projecting to have two uh, individuals leave uh, in mid-July, maybe by the end of July, and I have other officers that are eligible for retirement and could go at any moment. I also have unexpected um, duty injuries, sickness. things like duty injuries and sick time, and I detailed that, uh, illustrated that in my email to uh, to the chairperson. Um, so I think, you know, relative to your question, there's it. it while it seems very black and white and if you have full all the people there the people are not here i'm still paying their salary because they're away at training at the academy or riding with another officer while they're going through fto so i can't necessarily use them as a full uh a full capacity police officer to fill a seat in a patrol car by themselves understood uh it, it, but and, and this is helpful i appreciate the color um so when you talked about the vacancies, I think you had mentioned nine, right? Or, or thereabouts? Yeah, I currently we're right? nine. Yeah, we, okay. we so, have nine as of uh, the eighth of this okay. month. Okay. And 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 I and I appreciate that the two additional headcount won't, you know, they're gonna be on your payroll, but because they're going to the academy, they're not gonna be saving you on the overtime effectively in, until potentially April of next year. That's helpful. But what about the nine vacancies though? I imagine the overtime is also to help cover uh, for those nine vacancies. Uh, when do you expect to fill those nine vacancies? Not the two additional, but just the nine vacancies. The nine vacancies, um, year to date, we're gonna, or actually end of year, we did a projection, it's gonna save us like $325,000 in the salary line. Because we took, uh, actually, there's there's 13 total people coming came and went, but we have nine currently. Um, the lateral transfers, if we hire them in May, they probably won't get on the road till July. So they will be those nine vacancies will be into July. Laterals um, in July, and then the other five for the academy, not until next March earliest on their own. So nine months of the year. Yeah, I, I, let me let me ask it a different way. I'm trying to figure out um, when when that not this overtime piece, but this but the regular compensation when those vacancies will start actually drawing a check as opposed to being a budgeted dollars that are not being spent. The, the day they get hired, so the five or the four laterals, um, depending on when they get hired in May. So May and June, two months of this fiscal year, they'll draw a check, and the other five. Yeah. If they get hired uh, it's a June Academy they'll be uh, drawing a check for the last month of the fiscal year okay and, so uh, so all you expect all nine of those uh, headcount for at least the upcoming fiscal year which is what we're talking about this budget by July 1 all nine will be filled that's that's not accurate so okay. we'll have um, although we have uh, the, the Commission has approved who will go into those spots they will not start like we have one person that isn't starting till September. That's right. The yep. academy isn't starting until June 3rd. So we have four officers, I'm sorry, five officers that are slated to go to the academy June 3rd, which will take them um, six months and four months, 10 months from there. Yeah, 450 hours. Yeah. yeah but are when they were in the academy, are they on? your payroll yes, sir. they are they're drawing us out okay. the salary line and, and and that's exactly the point i'm trying to make or trying to dig down and drill on i'm trying to make sure i understand that if you've got someone if you've got a vacancy they're not drawing off the the salary line right but if you have someone who's on the payroll regardless of whether they're on the street um 
they're drawing a, a, a paycheck. And I want to make sure that we understand when you guys have salary going out, actual salary dollars, and uh, when you need the overtime. Oh, yeah, probably to speak to, they're getting paid in both spots, their spot, right? They're getting paid their salary and then overtime to fill their spot that they have not fully uh, earned the right to work yet because they're not certified or not trained. Okay. So until those people are up and running and able to be on their own, we have to absorb both. Okay, that's clear for me. Thank you. No further questions. I could just add uh, one other um, one other thing to your your question is historically we've gone over pretty significantly over in our overtime budget. So um, last year was 100, 100, 2021 was one hundred and ninety thousand over. Twenty twenty we were pretty neutral. I I contributed that to uh, COVID. I think we were just shy of a thousand dollars over um, and over the past you know 10 years we average anywhere between 75,000 and 150,000 over just because of the unpredictable uh, unpredictability of the uh, overtime and the vacancies thank you uh, mr. Curley thanks for that chief uh, Ms. Marmion Thanks very much. So my question goes to what you just addressed, which is you've stated that regardless of, of new hires, filling vacancies, et cetera, you expect overtime because of the fluid nature of people getting up to speed, being in the academy, retirements, lateral hires. So overtime in your mind is a given. We're always going to have this as a line and um, the, in other words, that's a given for us, but is there something that your department is doing or planning to do to get out ahead of this, that to reduce the overtime? Um, or are we going to see every year this, this overhead because of the fluid nature of your uh, hiring, et cetera, situation? I can speak a little bit to it. Um... You know, we, we really don't know. Um, vacancies, if you were full and everybody certified by July 1st, the replacement costs would go down significantly. Training overtime is still going to be there, but replacement cost for, for the contractual time off, there's still going to be overtime. We don't staff extra people. Um, we're pulled in a million different directions right now. We The boats aren't going back for 30 days later than they normally do. We don't have a public affairs person. We don't have a uh, two traffic people, so we'll be able to fill those billets. There'll always be some... Um, I realize in a perfect world, you'd like there to be none, but there's absolutely no way to run this police department without some sort of overtime. We looked at the 12, we went back as far as we had data for the 12 year histor historical data. I mean, some years two or 300,000 over, some years we gave back 90,000, 100,000. And I don't know what those were. I don't know what the hiring or manpower or type of crimes. We've had, you know, civil unrest, we've had hurricanes. Um, we have downtown problems with the kids, problems at the beach where we're pulled in all these different directions. And I don't know what next year, where we're gonna be pulled. If I said right now, we're not gonna need it and we have civil unrest, we're gonna, we're gonna blow the overtime out of the water um, just because we don't have those bodies. They all have, everybody has responsibilities and then we have extra responsibilities on top of it. Um, I don't think there's, there's a way to make assumptions based on past performance, but I don't know how to get it exact. If it was my checkbook, I understand. I'd, I'd, I'd want to know the exact number, but like when you put your kid in college, what's it going to cost you? And then all these ancillary costs come up that you didn't. I don't know if there's a way to pinpoint it exactly, unfortunately. Um, we can make assumptions and averages, um, but there's so many unknowns. Our crime rate, the way we investigate crimes have changed dra dramatically. We used to get somebody, arrest them, process them, send them to court. Um, they don't stop now. We have probably 20, 30 hours investigation. Not on all, but on some where it would be an hour or two uh, five years ago, two years ago. Um, the type of the type of investigations you are much more complex. Somebody wants a freedom of information. You have to pull six body cams. There's dozens of hours of work going into one freedom of information request, which we didn't have freedom of, freedom of information request five years ago was we print out the report and we give them recording from 911. It was an hour. That's 20, 30, 40 hours on some cases now. 
Um, and we don't know, they're, they're coming in on a, I mean, we're getting them daily, um, just from the public for different variety of reasons, lawsuits, um, audits, uh, people want to see how people are being treated. Um, anything else you think of that? Yeah, I mean, overall, uh, what the deputy chief just said is that the, the demands for police services, whether they be regular patrol or uh, things related to the Police Accountability Act, have increased and our officers have not. Um, as I said in the last meeting, could I come in here and ask for 10 officers? I know that wouldn't be favorable to the board. Um, uh, I think a, a town of our size should be at about 120 with the comparables. Uh, within the, the state of Connecticut. Um, I think you would see a significant reduction in overtime if we were at 120 members in our department. In the, yeah, in and I three... appreciate that. But, I mean, that's what I'm sort of getting at, this kind of, you know, looking at the being strategic in terms of what you need and proving, you know, making that case and so that we could look at overtime as not a necessary evil, but maybe as something that's managed um, because you've got the staff you need. So anyway, I appreciate your your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marmion. <clears throat> uh, Mr. DeWitt. Thank you, Madam Chair, Chris DeWitt. Um, as as a board member who's been who's been looking at the, the overtime line for 15 years, uh, I very much appreciate the fact that that you're trying to to reel this in uh, both both chiefs, um, and I am supportive of of adding these people because um, there are just a bunch of uh, unpredictable circumstances that we've had in the last two years, and I think there's more coming. And you you named a couple of them. Um, frankly, I'm uncomfortable kind of talking about the 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 you know the manpower. The overall manpower situation in an open in open form like this, but I got to tell you something. I would rather have more people under the chief and rely less on overtime. And with the, the in the news recently about some of the attrition you guys have had, people leaving for better positions and things. Um, if we don't start by adding these people and relying on the overtime more, I don't think we'll ever catch up. So I'll tell you what, Chief, you want to go to 120, you, 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 you got my vote because I think it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. But um, I, I don't know why we're having such discussion over, over these, these additional officers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, I don't, I don't think there's any discussion over the additional officers. It was just adding more officers and adding more overtime, um, to be clear. But uh, Mr. Walsh? Thank you, Chief Calamaris and Deputy Chief Broderick for being here. And, and you guys laid out some really good points about all the additional work that you have to do. Um, and I just want to, can you explain overtime, when we pay overtime to the officers, do they get that at a different rate than they do their normal rate? They do, time and a half by contract. Time and a half, okay. So it makes it more expensive, correct? It does. Um, and uh, I want to compliment your department um, because I've also been involved with this for, unfortunately, I don't know, fortunately, I'm not sure, but for t over 20 years between the board of, uh, between the RTM board of selectmen and the board of finance. And I would say that your overtime numbers consistently through that 20 something years have been the most consistent and not over budget numbers that I've ever seen. It's actually a little surprising the last couple of years, but you've explained why. And it shows a great level of responsibility for you guys to do that year in and year out for that period of time. And I've often commented about why the fire department seems to be consistently over every single year and you guys were bringing it in. I was almost like saying they should go for some, maybe some courses through your department to try to figure out how you do it because you guys have consistently 
brought that number in on budget. I want to start from that position because the way that happens is it takes work. It takes analysis and takes responsibility to be able to do that. So I wanted to just commend you on that. And uh, you've laid out a pretty good case, not only the other night, on why the number needs to be where it is. And it's got to be tough with nine open positions to be able to plan these numbers. But also in your follow-up um, document, um, Chief, I think, believe you're the one who sent that off, or maybe it was both of you working on it or your entire department. Who knows how many people have to work on that. But um, I, I really appreciate it because it really gave, gave some flavor. And it also showed, and I think you mentioned it when you were be originally before us on your budget, that you were not happy that your overtime was over and that you wanted to kind of cons get it back to the point where you were properly budgeting for it, right? That's correct. That's really all we can really ask here on the Board of Finance is that you responsibly budget for your overtime on what it should be. Because as you guys are sitting here, you're not overblowing that budget, right? You're, you're not giving us a too high of a number, correct? You're giving what you think is the actual amount as best as you can determine on something that's kind of questionable as the year goes by, correct? Absolutely. We went based off the three-year average and consistently in the last three years, we were over budget averaging $40,000. Okay. And um, following up on what Mr. DeWitt said, which I, I fully agree with, um, I too, when I first saw two officers being added, I was a little skeptical, but after having your presentation and understanding it a little better, um, it made a lot more sense, especially with people trying to poach our people for other jobs all the time. It's is that correct? Correct. That's correct. So, um, if we were to try to like make a cut, or somebody here was supposed to make a cut, try to make a cut, I personally think it would be irresponsible. Um, I presume you would not want that to happen. Would you consider that to be, you know, not properly budgeting your department? I would agree with that. And I want to be clear. Um, I, I think, thank you very much for answering, answering my questions. Personally, I'm going to fully fund your, your, your budget. Thank you. I want to be clear that I don't want to defund your department or what you do. Your work is too important to this community especially all the things that are going on and have gone on for the last number of years. So I think we all got to keep that in mind and we've got to properly budget this, um, this budget. Um, the, I have no problem with the overtime earnings. I look at them for every department. And um, so I appreciate all the information you've been able to give us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Matola. Hey, Chief, thanks for your answers. Um, on, the, on the FOIA stuff that you mentioned, and maybe this is a general question for the town, and I don't know if the town's thought about this, but where I work, I, I agree, I work for the city of Bridgeport, and, and, and we, are, we, we do get slammed with FOIA requests, and we're trying to manage those things. So I guess my first question, you, do, do you handle all departmental FOIA requests in-house or... Uh, does the town, Brenda, and, and maybe you don't, and maybe you might start thinking about doing something like this. Do, do we have a FOIA officer in Fairfield that can um, assist departments in complying with FOIA requests? And the reason why I ask that, it, it may be a way to save money in the long run and get away from some of the uh, issues that the chief has mentioned. And it sounds like, chief, that part of your overtime costs is attributed to the numerous FOIA requests you get these days. I know that's a long-winded statement and a few questions, but if someone could comment on that, I, I'd appreciate it. I'll just Go ahead, I'll comment on that. So the, the, the risk management uh, department and human resources uh, takes on some of the FOIA requests. However, they don't have access to our case management system. Oh, right. 
Eighty percent of the work is done by our officers who are designated to do that job that have or have the ability to access our case management system, our uh, records redaction and our records department. So all that stuff is not accessible by risk management. So it has to be done by a sworn officer within this agency. Is 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 that all? Is that all done during overtime, or is that just some officer's regular duty during a regular shift, or is it a combination of both? I would say that it's shared. Yeah. It's shared okay. in cases in cases that it needs to get done right away for a prosecutor. Uh, it may incur some overtime in cases that uh, you know it's. Uh, for an attorney who's filing a civil case, we do it at our own pace, so that can be done on straight time, and we do our best to manage okay. that uh, that that effort. All right, thank you, Chief. I don't, Brenda, I don't know if you wanted to say something. I I thought I saw you raise your hand, but if not, that's okay too. Yeah, John, I was just going to say that they handle their own uh, FOI okay. request. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Matola. Yeah, I, I'm, you asked that. I was actually going to ask the same question in terms of whether, um, you know, whether it needed to be um, an officer doing that, you know, a sworn officer doing that work. I mean, I understand it needs to be someone in your department. So I'm just, just spitballing here. But, you know, I just think about the nature of the work and what it involves. And does that need to be an officer or would it benefit you to have an individual, you know, working as part of the department whose, whose job that was? Um, even if it wasn't a full-time job, maybe th there might be other administrative duties, but I guess that's my question. Cause I, I appreciate the fact that, you know, in today's world, now we've got body cameras, we've got, everybody's got videos and all this stuff. You're going to get these requests and I fully can appreciate that they're more um, costly to comply with. Um, so maybe just, can you just share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I just, I think over the last few years, they just become so, uh, it, it's labor, just labor become, intensive. yeah, labor intensive uh, with all the information that we're gathering. Um, I know the new Axon program has a lot of self-redaction that's with the with the body cams, which makes it easier for prosecutorial on the prosecutorial end. Um, I'll also add that uh, we're mandated for every single report if it's going to be adjudicated in the in the court. Um, we are required to provide all of that information to them at the time that they request it. Um, so it's a little more. It's a little more burdensome. It used to just be, as Keith showed you before, it was, you know, here's the report um, and maybe some photocopies of some pictures. And now it's just become uh, just entirely more burdensome, more more technical from an IT perspective. And and I, I get that. I guess I'm still trying to just get to the question of whether that has to be um, an officer doing that work. I mean, do you want an officer doing that work basically? Um, or, or would that be, could that be handled by, um, you know, another type of role in the department to allow the officers to do, you know, the work that you want them to be doing out in the community? So that's my question. I think we run into some labor issues. There's, there's twofold. We deal with some pretty sensitive stuff. Um, some pretty sensitive, some pretty, uh, Graphic. Yeah, some some things we wouldn't want people outside of our PD to see. Um, the, the the systems we use to gather some of the information, you have to be certified to use. Plus, it's been uh, labor wise, it's been a union job. So we just renegotiated with the union, and we gave our records redaction, our body cam redaction, to our records officers. So we moved it out of some some people's hands who are very busy and put it down on one of our records. Still a sworn officer, but he's going to be in an office. It's not somebody off the road that has internal affairs or general investigations. So we, we just renegotiated with our union to put that job downstairs in records. So it's going to where it, it should be, but it's not a civilian, it's still a sworn officer. Okay. The union would so have to give up that work. They'd have to negotiate and give up that work. So it's going there. So at, at some point that that shouldn't hopefully be a, a contributing factor to what I, what you refer to as regular overtime, right? 
if you've got it should help, it should help. yeah I mean, it, it should could be it, but you've got okay and that's what i was getting at it just seemed like you know i mean i listen i don't i don't know anything about this but i i just uh it would seem to me that that's not you know what you know complying with foia requests wouldn't be the top thing that officers would want to be spending their time on and or the most valuable thing they'd be spending their time on so that's why i'm asking um it's a heavy lift and for anybody yeah it really is okay well thank you for that that's helpful um other questions from the board mr stark yeah so um i'm going to come in at the end i hope it's the end and just dumb this down a little uh in my usual way um so uh in uh section 4030 full-time current, I see a full-time current headcount of 115. Um, and that includes the two uh, new recruits, yes? Um, what page are you on, sir? I'm on 147 or 153 of the PDF. Total full-time 115, that includes administrative. Um, right. Uh, assistance yes. yes and it includes the two new uh police officers right yes that's that's correct sir okay and um what's um what's current in this same category what's current headcount can i just correct uh what i just said so sure, sure. Uh, current current total projected proposed total would be 116 because we're 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 adding I two might officers. Might have just anticipated my question. We we're proposing two officers, but we're losing an IT uh, person to okay. to the IT department. Oh right, 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 right. Okay. Um, and then what's in the same category? What's current headcount? Current headcount for sworn officers is one hundred and eight. Okay. And there's something besides sworn officers in here? Uh, yeah, you have uh, a secretary A, two positions, secretary B, two positions. Okay, so that's 112. And then we have an account clerk, one position. And then we also have a mechanic, one position. 114. Okay, well, but, but um, then how do vacancies figure into this? Then an IT support technician. Do you see that? that? Yeah. Wait, so of the 114 current, do you have any vacancies? Current. Sorry? 115 current. Okay. And do you have any vacancies in that? Nine vacancies. Okay. All so 115 assumes you go from 104 currently filled positions to 115 filled positions from July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2023. And I just need your word on this. Do you, do you, you, you think that's realistic? You think you're going to have those positions fold on average during that period at 115? that's what we're budgeting for right 116. yes yeah, so we have those individuals selected for those sworn officer positions now there's still some background checks and things like that that have to occur um if they fail out of the background checks then there's going to be vacancies for even longer because it's going to take time for the commission to put together a, for us to put together a hiring panel for the commission and for right. them to do election process and then go through that background process again. So so 115 is the max possible payroll for the next fiscal year in this in this category, right? 116 is the max payroll for the next fiscal year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So there's a possibility you surprise on the upside financially but in the down but downside to you, because I know you want these people. Like you, you, it is very possible total full-time current only ends up being like 113 or something like that. That That's within the realm of the possible, right? That is possible. Okay. 
Cool. I just wanted to make sure I had the right benchmarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stark. Uh, Mr. Walsh. Gentlemen, um, can I just ask you, uh, you mentioned that you're removing some of the uh, video copying or dash cam, cam and body cam work down to an individual in the records department. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. That person currently have no work to do or let, like half the work to do? I presume that they're pretty busy during the day anyway, correct? It, the, the, they, there's two officers down there and there's one position that's vacant that's normally filled. So are they going to be able to handle all that? Or are you still going to have to use officers to, to do that work? Some of it. Well, we're, we're not filling other positions because of the shortage we're having in patrol. So those are patrol officers that assume positions in other areas as a specialty. Um, and we haven't filled that position for that reason. So it's not like any of that work's going away by the number of hours that you see it being done, correct? That's correct. Right. Work still needs to get done. Right, but our priority remains servicing the community. And I think, you know, when we see a shortage of nine individuals on our police department, uh, we start to prioritize very carefully. I, I understand. I just want to make sure because it seemed I, I just wanted there not to be any type of. When you're answering Ms. Charlton's questions, I believe it was her question. Um, you know, that it's the fact that you've cut some deal with the union doesn't mean some of the work's going away or that some officer is sitting there not doing anything. Um, those the, the amount of work's still there. There's still going to be overtime work to be able to cover all that stuff and everything else. Like that, correct. That's correct. Correct. We so just have it written in the description. That doesn't alter any of your numbers um, going into how much you need for overtime which is coming here, correct? Correct. Okay. And in regards to the number of officers, I'm getting Mr. Stark's question. You're doing everything possible to fill all those positions, correct? I mean, anything's possible. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of things that are possible, but you're planning for what's probable, correct? That's you know, correct. All, all the work you need to do to fill those seats, correct? All the, you're, you're trying to fill all those officer slots, correct? Give Fairfield the best security you can give them, correct? Yes, sir. I'm sure. Uh, yes, Mr. Testani. Thank you. Hey, Chief. Thanks again for coming tonight. I have a few questions and uh, a couple comments, but one. A question I had was uh, something you mentioned, uh, Chief Kelmaris, I believe it was, on the risk management piece. So if I understood you correctly, some of the FOIA requests go to risk to the risk management team person. Uh, that's That would be outside the department or is that someone within the department? It's in the risk management for the town uh, in HR. Am I right with that? That's correct. Okay. And if I can just only only because sometimes the requests for FOIA come through the town attorney and and it just takes a different process before it comes to us. Right. No, understood. Do you do you have a percentage, Chief, about how many of the FOIA requests go to risk management and how many get handled internally, roughly? I thought I heard twenty percent, but I could be wrong with that. I, I couldn't give you a percentage, but I could say okay, okay. If, it has to do with our department. Most of the most of the effort comes from our department because of our access to our case management system. And HR right. does not have access to our case management. Right. That's the distinction you made earlier. Understood. On the uh, Police Accountability Act requirements, I know from having read articles of not just Fairfield, but other towns, that it takes a, an incredible amount of you know, manpower to fill those requirements as well. Are you including your, this kind of conversation we've been having on the FOIA requests, are those part of those police accountability requirements that the state passed as well? Yes. They, they could be, you know, I guess, right? Yes, and, and you know, I think it's more, 
Yeah. It's more about, um, you know, and it's, it's just additional work that comes uh, as a result of some of the requirements that put they put on. For example, in order to be an accredited agency, which is now a part of the Police Accountability Act, there's certain things you have to fulfill in order to be an accredited agency. So uh, every agency in the uh, state of Connecticut has to be accredited through CALEA as the legislation reads right now. And in order to be accredited through CALEA, you are required to fulfill certain um, certain mandates that in order to be accredited. So one of them, for example, is fulfilling FOIA requests or uh, redacting certain information from reports or being able or having access to um, fulfill those requests. So would it be fair to say, Chief, that it it's very difficult to put a quantitative amount on the time that had to been dedicated to fulfill those requests through the Accountability Act, as well as the FOIA request? It, it sounds like it takes an incredible amount of manpower for all of those things. And, you know, it, it sounds like there's no way to really exactly quantify how that shakes out in the end. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. And, and I'll also add that, you know, and that's why we look at th uh, three year uh, historicals for that to try to make those assumptions going forward. Right. And from what our discussion started out with tonight on the overtime, we're within that three year average range, maybe on the slider, slightly higher end, right? Because of the increase in vacancies for this particular year. Am I right with that and how you calculated the overtime for this budget? Sure. Yes, sir. It's a fair statement. And with the sworn officers, I forgot my um, how it's calculated, but the ones that get transferred, and by the way, that's a great, a really great, great tribute. I mentioned it, uh, I believe, at our last meeting to your leadership, both of you and the rest of the uh, officers in the department, to have people want to laterally transfer into Fairfield is really quite a tribute. Um, so, out of my own curiosity's sake, do they get paid from the day they sign the the contract with Fairfield, right? So let's say they're, it's a, it's an officer from Westport and they want to laterally transfer and they want to come in, let's just say it's August 1st. And that's the date that you and this new officer agreed to as far as they're starting their process of learning Fairfield system. They get paid from that very first day. Is that right? That's correct. They do. Okay. All right. And again, you know, I just want to echo a lot of Mr. Walsh's sentiments in terms of how I support this budget and how I support, again, your leadership, both of you, uh, and how it reflects in the rest of the department. I mentioned the lateral transfers. I think it's a great tribute to you and to the department. To think about where Fairfield was just two years ago. You know, Mr. Walsh mentioned the word defund. There was also an, a word de dismantle that was used as well a couple of years ago. And it's certainly one that I, for one, would never propose and would only do everything I can as an individual board member to support this proposed budget and certainly what you have proposed for overtime and certainly the two officers. So again, thank you for your leadership and your um, time with the department. It certainly shows in everyone's dedication within your ranks. So thank you so much again for coming tonight. Thank, thank you, Mr. Testani. Uh, other questions from board members? Mr. Stark? Yeah, I, I don't like to speechify, but I'll echo what Mr. Testani just said. Um, I know you're not political people like we are, and these questions all probably seem like they have an ulterior motive, but you did a great job explaining your budget to us, and I'm I'm in full support. That's all. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. Much. Stark. Other questions from the board? Uh, John? No. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Chief, Assistant Chief, thank you very much for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, you're off the hook. 
Hey, thank, thank you, you very so much. much for your time. Have a great night. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, you. good night. Okay, so we are still on uh, item four of the agenda and our next topic is finance department revenue, um, dividend and interest income. So that is gonna be on page eight of your budget book uh, and it's account 44001. So uh, the board may recall that this a question about this uh, revenue estimate came up previously and I believe Mr. Um, Schmidt had sent a revised calculation uh, as a result of that. Um, but maybe uh, Mr. Schmidt, you wanna take us through the revised calculation and any further revisions that you have to it or and we can just talk about this in general. <clears throat> Frank's gonna take the lead on this. We had some additional conversations with our investment advisors. Okay, and, and given that we don't, um, do you have anything to share on the screen during this discussion or, or no? I yeah, do. We're gonna yep. share. Okay, great. You could, you could zoom in because I'll, I'll go through one yeah. account at a time. So thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to rehash what you had said, um, you mentioned page eight is where you can find the, um, the original for select woman proposed projection for dividend and interest income. Um, but another page that I would also turn your attention to is page 19, which also kind of shows, I know there've been some questions about prior year actuals and page 19 shows the prior year actuals. So if anybody is interested in that, they, they, they can take a look at that. Um, so in response to questions to prior meetings um, and some follow-up questions for the board, we were asked to go over this calculation and show how we came to it. Um, so I'll just go over the methodology um, for, the, for the first kind of two passes we had at this. And then the, the third pass was kind of the revised methodology we use, kind of focusing on what we would expect to maybe bring in versus what we've brought in um, and using that as a metric to project forward instead of, like I said, more of um, what we're actually getting perspective. Um, so just to summarize, we, as I said, in the first select woman's budget, this was, let me get back to the page. Uh, interest in dividend income was at 448,000. Um, we had sent a document around to the board. So I'm just getting my pages out here. Um, increasing that number to 534,400. Um, and so I'll go, I'll, I'll go through the backup for that 534,400 now, which is what we're looking at on the screen. So for our stiff account, we, we like I said, we took what we were getting, um, assuming that the environment would kind of be the same, um, and, and we annualized those numbers. So I took these from the, from the general ledger and the bank statements. Um, so for stiff, we had estimated 22,000. Um, for our Fairfield County money market account, we had estimated 7,500. People's money market account, we had two accounts for those, that was 56,000. Um, and our Bankwell money market account and CD account, we had 83,626. Um, for our financial advisors, for our financial advisors and, and Frank, what they do sorry. for us. Can I, can I just, um, do, do you mind if we just, uh stop and, and um, on this one point first and ask any questions that we have on this one before you go on to the uh, nef next piece? Yes, absolutely, yep. So just to, to um, cause I, I think I think this is where some of the questions came up. So on the, on the money market accounts, you annualized based on the current year. And so annualizing would assume that, that um, next year we expect to have roughly the same amount of money invested at roughly the same interest rate, right? Correct. Okay. Did anybody want to ask, did any uh, board members have questions on this before we move on, Mr. Stark? Yeah, I've always had a question about this. And it was uh, a few weeks ago, could we see what's in the current portfolio? Did we ever, Madam Chair, did we ever get an answer to that? Uh, we we got information, but, but yeah. this particular piece that we're talking about, the money market, um, yeah. 
Do you want more color? Because I just want to cover this well, money market piece too, and then we can I'll go. Just throw this out there, and uh, you know, I, I understand that um, not everyone is a secondary markets professional like myself. But what I would, all I was trying to get at was that I think the diminished interest income next year um, must be a function of the writing down of principal offset to the positive by higher interest income because interest rates are going up. But I, I never, but, but it's, a, it's really just a question of timing, right? If treasuries are, if the federal reserve is going to raise interest rates seven times, then a lot of the, a lot of the reduction in the, in principal value is going to happen before June 30th. Right. And so some of the, um, underperformance of this portfolio will actually be realized in this uh, fiscal year rather than next. But without actually seeing the portfolio, and, and I'm not entirely sure why we can't see it, I, I don't I don't really know. And then that leaves me kind of in a blind spot about whether to, you know, question these interest income projections for next fiscal year versus this fiscal year. Do we end up in the same place eventually? Yeah, we totally do. But, you know, I'm just throwing it out there. Anyway, so so Mr. Stark, to answer a few of your a few of your questions, um, uh, my first comment would be that I, I've spoken with our, a number of our financial advisors, and and my first response would be yes, the, the Fed did say they said that they would do that. That doesn't mean they're actually um, going to do it, and and that's oh, not that coming from me. That's very coming... naive. I am sorry. <laughs> well, like I said, listen, it, it, it's Federal Reserve does me. not monkey around with this stuff. We have one okay. person talk at a time. Yeah, and, and like and like I said, Mr. Stark, it, 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 it's fine to disagree with me, but that's coming from our financial advisors who, who advise us on that. And I and I spoke to a number of them, and that's what they told me. Is there any um, reason so why I, we can't see the actual portfolio? Well, um, we're going to click through it right now. Okay, then I am so if, so premature. On the Go backup ahead. that was, on the backup that was provided, we we, pro we provided these tabs. If you go to um, if you scroll down, Jared, this talks about this is what we have with uh, Janny in um, cash and uh, bonds. I, I'm sorry, Frank. Before we move off the money market, can you go back to that first page? Because I think we'll get into detail here, but I'd like to just sure. go back to that first page, make sure I understand that. Um, so if you scroll up to the top there, I think there were, what, four different accounts we're talking about here? Yeah, if I, were if I, money market accounts. So Correct. I want to understand, the 22,257 is what we saw the other day. Uh, you've got a notation here, 25 basis points, and then an increase, a higher number, 4693. Yeah. Am I interpreting that to say you've, you've made an assumption to increase that interest, the interest on that account by 25 basis points and the new number is 4693 that's correct okay and so, so the total if, if you scroll down to the bottom or if we look at yep. the bottom page yep um the new total number would be 705,000, and the um and and the prior number with our old methodology not the original first select woman proposed, but the second time we went around was 534. Yeah. Um, so the new number would be 705,933. And so, so we, we changed the two, interest. 257,693 or 639. Yeah, and, yes, and that is, um, I believe that's the increase from the first select woman's budget. Okay. Th that That's helpful for me. Um, I, I'm curious about why you, how you derived the 25 versus 50 basis points on, on the different of uh, the poor accounts. Sure. So, I, I mean, it was all about the starting point. So when I spoke with my financial when I spoke with the advisors, one thing that they, you know, one thing that we went over was that, you know, different banks, we have a number of banks here. And so the, the starting point was some of them for some of them were different. For example, Janney, um, it, it, it's not there for them, but they're at three basis points now, and we have them um, going to 25 based on what they told us. But some banks were offering um, better rates at the cost of not charging as many fees. And so when I spoke with them, they said that, that they said that that 
first Fed rate increase um, would kind of be absorbed by the increase in a, 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 an increase in fees that um, that the uh, banks would make up essentially. So you wouldn't see that full 25. And like I said, some banks offer a, a different rate just to attract more people to put money in their institution. And so that was the basis behind those different numbers there. Sure. And, and I don't think we need to spend any more time on, on these accounts. I think the two portfolio accounts will be of interest to Mr. Stark. Um, so we can go there. Sure. Thank you for pausing on this. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. And just to level set, based on the new calculations, where we are right now, um, you would recommend or, or you you could support the 448,000 being increased to 700, roughly 706,000, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So go go ahead. And sorry to interrupt in the middle of that, but but that was helpful. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. So just going through this, uh, this shows what we have um, as far as what we have in bonds. We have four million cash and cash alter cash and um, alternatives is twenty one million. And so the you know. The, the interest and dividends on the bonds, uh, they are what they are. Um, those aren't going to change based on any Fed rate hikes, um, um, save for except whatever we, we, we purchase in new bonds. Um, the number that would really change here as, as a result of fate, uh, rate hikes would be the $21 million. Um, and so that's where, that's where the increased assumption led us to, uh, you know, that, that, that's where it's hitting here. Uh, similar report, um, this is from our Ameriprise advisors, and here we have a little bit less money with them. We have $4.9 in um, in the market for, with bonds, and then we have $3.8 in cash and cash alternatives, and the same kind of mechanics going on. Unless we, uh, unless we issue anything new, we wouldn't see anything besides the interest on cash and cash alternatives here. Madam Chair, Chair, and the last one was a question. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead, um, Mr. Sir. Okay. Uh, so the okay. So Ameriprise's analysis only applies to the portion they manage. Correct. Correct. Okay, and they've got a much longer maturity portfolio than the first portfolio. The first portfolio was Janney. Is that right? Yes. Okay, and then um, the Janney portfolio, the maturity was only one point six seven years, correct? And um, correct. are they? Uh, are this is this basically all hold to maturity securities? Yes. Okay, that that that's really where I was going because um, on a one point six seven year maturity portfolio, you're not really going to care whether um, the Fed raises interest rates because you're holding them in maturity and. 100 is 100 at the end of the day. You're going to get that back. But on a four-year maturity like this Ameriprise portfolio, yeah, within fiscal year 22-23, you are going to take a negative mark on principal because every existing treasury out there will be marked lower as new higher-yielding maturity treasuries are issued. But I see... This is only 4.75 million of the portfolio, and that's not too bad. I mean, there's nothing really you can do. That's that's what I was trying to get at. Uh, that's what I've been trying to figure out this whole time. What was and, the balance and, and, in Janney again? Um, bonds or bonds plus cash and no, cash. Everything in Janney, yeah. Everything was 21, so about okay. 26 so, million. So you, you've actually done a really good job of protecting us from interest rate increased shocks um, by having so much short duration stuff in the portfolio. That's what I was trying to get at. Thank you. Okay. Here. Thank you, Mr. Stark. Frank, did you have anything else? Um, just Saxon, which I, I don't believe there are any questions on, but for Saxon Securities, um, those are those, these are a little bit different. These are CDs and um, the um, our financial advisor gave us, you know, they they incorporated the expected hikes, the expected hikes into their analysis, and so this is where we uh, 
this is where we are. Okay. Yep. And Matt, so, Madam uh, Chair, can I ask a question? Uh, sure. Go ahead, Mr. Curley. Thank you. Um, and I, I apologize for asking verbally, but I know the screen is taken, so I'm not sure you saw my hand. No, that's um, great. So, uh, if you, if you, if I interpret this action um, information correctly, they're they're expecting six uh, increases from the Fed at twenty in twenty five basis point increments. That's taken into account into their number. They get to the one twenty eight four sixty seven. Can you do me a favor and go back to your top sheet to show me where the one twenty eight four sixty seven feeds into your number. All right, perfect. Okay, so I see that the 128467 in row 54. Perfect. So now if we go to the Ameriprise tab and go back to that backup, um, I just want to understand. So I'm seeing the 128126 and roughly E14 or 15, right? Those two numbers. That's flowing through to the top page as well, correct? Correct. All right, can we see that? I just want to note the cell. All right, there it is. Perfect. 53. All right. Now, if we can do the same thing on the Janney backup, that would be helpful because I'm seeing 108, 102 on the summary page. And I'm not seeing the 108, 102 here. I'm seeing either 121 or 130 in those in those two uh, cash flows. Yeah. And, 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 and that was just a difference. So um, Janney kind of went through and, and the reports that we're looking at um, for Janney and Ameriprise are just, they look 12 months out, so not 12 months. They don't look at a fiscal year. Um, at the time we asked them to run those, it only was a portion of the fiscal year. So they actually were able to, Janney in this case, was able to give me the number of, um, you know, interest payments that we would receive on the bond portion as 99000 um, And then they gave me another estimate for, um, interest on the cash was, which was about eight thousand. So, um, you know, this, okay, this, so that's why the number was different. They so that number doesn't the, tie back yeah. to the report then. No, no. Okay. Sorry about that. No, that that's fine. I did, look, I, I, I'm not questioning the number. I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the process. Um, so, uh, sure. did, I appreciate that you followed up with them and got the got it, the number correct. If it does, if the report doesn't sync up with our fiscal year, you, that sounds like the right adjustment to make. Um, no, I, uh, Madam Chair, I have no further questions. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Schmidt um, or, or Frank, um, sorry, use a mixture of the first and last names here. <laughs> you just, uh, could you just make sure that the whole board has this spreadsheet? That would be great. Email yeah. it to us, yeah. please. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much. All right. Do any other board members, you could take it down for now so we can see everybody. And do any other board members have questions on this? Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, let's, let's move on then. Um, and uh, Frank and Jared, appreciate you taking us through that and uh, we'll wait for the spreadsheet. So thank you again. Okay. So moving on to the next topic under item four, uh, the education budget. Uh, so two things here. Uh, the Board of Ed, which we have a separate budget book on, um, and also Department 2531 Private School Bus Transportation. That is on page 111 of our budget book. So um, just kind of looking at the screen here to see who we have with us. I see um, Ms. Vitali, Chair of the Board of Education, Mr. Peterson. Um, I'm not sure who is going to, uh, I see Ms. Laborious there. Um, so I don't have questions for you in advance, but if if uh, I know some board members had questions about the education budget, so if anyone has questions, um, please raise your hand and uh, the right person can respond to them. Okay, Mr. Walsh. Here I have questions around both the Board of Education budget plus on the private school busing. So I'll start off with the Board of Education and then maybe the rest of the our members can ask the same thing and then we'll go separately if you don't mind to public school, I mean private school busing in the regular budget, town budget. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Okay. Um so I guess to um I don't know whether who would have the answer to this. I'm not sure whether it's Mr. Laborious or Mr. Cummings. But 
the ARPA funding that you have for this coming fiscal year is how much? Mr. Um, if, if I may, Mr. Charlton and Ms. Daly, can I answer that um, directly? Uh, yes, you have, um, you, you have an echo though, Ms. Laborious. I don't know if you. Oh, I do apologize. Um, I mean, we can probably. Uh, we could probably make do. Let's. Why don't you try and go through it, and then we'll we'll see if it works. Everybody, if everyone else can maybe mute, that might help. I'm, I'm so, so sorry. sorry. Okay. And our answer is 2.9 million. That's, That's a multi-year multi -year amount. The um, ESSER 2 funding um, has to be spent and drawn down by September of 2023. And the ESSER by September, the following September 2024. And Ms. Laborious, I could you just repeat the two amounts again? Because it was a little bit hard to understand. Esser two. Oh, yes, yes Esser two is one point two million, one point two eight two, one million two hundred eighty two thousand forty five dollars, and the ARP Esser is two million eight hundred eighty one thousand three hundred seventeen. Thank you. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Um. All right, uh, Ms. Laboris, do you have two microphones going at the same time, like your computer and your phone at the same time? Because that might be causing the issue. For some, I do not. Um, I apologize. I do not, um, and I haven't really had encountered this problem, this problem yet, yet. So I apologize. No problem. We'll try to work through it. Okay. <laughs> so, is it the district's plan to use the? Is it the ARP money for um, some? Um, summer school um, program, summer program, in order to help um, with learning loss. Correct. Yes, yes there, there is um, funding dedicated last summer and this upcoming summer to learning loss, as well as there's funding for an after school program that's running this year and an annual. Uh, it's planned to run again next year. So, for last year. Um, I presume the district identifies students that should participate in the summer program for learning loss, correct? Ms. Vitale, would you mind um, answering the program aspect of that? I apologize today. Yes, I will. Hello, everybody. Christina Tellis, the Board of Education. Yes, the um, we've run a variety of programs to address learning loss. Last summer, we ran a summer boost program for our elementary school and middle school pro children. Um, during this current school year, we're running an after school program for middle and high school programming. So last summer, how many students did you identify? And then how many students took advantage of the program. Can you give me both numbers? Sorry, I'm going to have to get those for you. I don't have them in front of me right now. The exact number. Was it a fair, it would, was it a very high percentage? Was it in the 90s? 90% 90 of the children of the district? It, yeah, that you identified that you thought should have, should attend the summer program for learning loss. And it was not how that, many students took took advantage of it. It was not that high, um, ninety percent. It was. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, and I don't want to give you misinformation. I can um, share that to you if one of my fellow board members that's on has that information. Um, I welcome you to input that and share that information. Otherwise, we can forward that to you. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to look it up right now. I know that information was provided to us at one point, but I, I am trying to locate it. Yeah. And I do apologize, Mr. Walsh. Um, we've gotten an incredible amount of information. Um, 
and we do have it and it's probably posted on our website. It's been shared at multiple meetings and I just don't have the numbers memorized on the top of my head. And I, I, um, I do apologize for that. No, but, um, no, no need to apologize. Um, we're, I mean, I'm, 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 you can just get it to me. I'd appreciate it. Sure. So was there savings um, recognized by the district by not having to um, have the program for all the students that you had presumed um, or at least wanted to take the summer program? There, there was a little bit of savings from the original budget, and that money um, enabled us. You know, the Board of Education, the superintendent proposed a budget of you know over 6%. In our budget deliberations, the Board of Education re re reduced the superintendent's original amount, um, working with administration to you know, identify some funding in the ESSER II and the ARP ESSER to offset some of the increases that were in the operating budget. So we were able to move some items out of the operating budget and have it covered in the grant. So there was some fluidity from the time that the original budget for ARP ESSER was developed in the summer as we ran this programming, um, some of the, you know, the, the, the anticipated cost change, which freed up some funding, which enabled us to move. We moved some of the math textbooks into the ARP ESSER. We moved um, the Tomlinson air chiller from the operating budget into the grant funding. Um, I think there was some professional development. Do you have and any sense was, of um, what that number was total? Yeah. yeah. Just thing I do have that in front of me. 981,133 was shifted from, uh, re reduced from the grant. So when we originally applied for the grant, it was with an assumption. And then as we had the experience of the summer school, we mapped what would happen the next year to that experience for the current year, what happened this past summer. And so as a result of that, and then working with the board, looking critically at each piece as we planned out, Knowing that the um, you know our, the town um, needed us to come with a lower ask, we did work with the board to make that reduction, a series of reductions to the multi-year grants. So it is multi-year; it's not just for the single year. Um, so that we could add the Tomlinson and Chiller, um, the textbook, and um, community liaison support and support to come from our budget request into the grant request. Um, not causing that a cliff because these were truly one time in nature. Okay, so that was for the fiscal year 22 budget. I just, I just want to make sure I'm clear. Correct, yes. yes. Okay, so and then you're running that same program this year or something similar to that program this year? We are planning on running the summer program, um, in this upcoming between. The 2021, 2022 school year and 2022, 2023. Okay. And have you identified Sorry, already? The Can I just add, I, I'm, I apologize for interrupting you. Um, I don't know if Mr. Kelly or anybody has a suggestion about Ms. Laborious, because I, I can barely get a word. I can barely understand a word. And if if you don't, court, if you don't have more than one microphone, I, I'm not sure what it is, but I, I think we're, several of us are struggling here. Uh, yeah, I apologize. I'll call Correct. in instead. Okay, that, right. that would be helpful. I, I'd, I'd appreciate that. And again, I apologize well, to Mr. Walsh. Yeah, the other thing you could do, Ms. Laborious, is you could keep your screen on and turn the volume off, turn the microphone off, and then call in with your phone. I've done that personally myself. Yeah. And um, that might, this way we could see you talking, which, which would be helpful. That's great. Um, Ms. Tarleton, I don't want to... um. You know, take control of your meeting, but we also, I know there were some questions about transportation and we have Mr. Schneider on the phone. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to go out of order and maybe we can handle that first. And Ms. Laborious, maybe you can log off of the meeting and then log back on and maybe that might correct the problem that you're having with your sound. And in the interim, if it's okay with, uh, with you, Madam Chair. Uh, no, absolutely. I... There's no order to these two sets of questions. So if uh, if that's helpful, let, why don't we do that? Let, let Ms. Laborious work on that. Mr. Walsh, do you have questions on? I have another question to the Board of Ed that I can go to now until Ms. Laborious comes back on. Okay. 
that I don't think will involve that I don't think will involve her. So that might be a handy area to go to, so we don't burn any time. So my next question, I guess, and I'm not sure, is Mr. Cummings on here tonight? He is not on right now. He had another commitment. We're sorry, we didn't. We were not um, on the original agenda, so I do apologize. No, not a problem. I just I wanted to give him due respect if he was here, but I wasn't seeing him um, show up, so I, I won't. I will stop using his name. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I'm glad you 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 were all able to make it. Um, you and Jeff were able to make it. I think you're the only ones on. But if there's anybody else, I apologize for for not recognizing. But um, so. At your um, at your meeting where you were doing your um, making about to vote on and hearing the final things on the budget, um, health insurance came up, right? And you were were you told that the state is was going to be handing you down a larger number than you voted? When we voted, we did find out. Um... I think it was the day or the night before that the state was projecting an 8% um, increase for the health insurance rate. We had budgeted for 6.5 and at that point that we did not make the adjustment down. Um, you know, we're still based on last year's experience. You know, the number did change from January to March. It had adjusted down, so we kept the 6.5. Um, unfortunately, and at that time, there was also some talk that maybe some grant, federal grant money the state had would be put into the 2.0 plan that would further lower the rate. Um, in the month or so since we passed our budget, actually two months now, we have since learned that the federal money was put into the current fiscal year to help the funding in the 2.0 plan. So we did not make any adjustment to the line item for health insurance. And this is the approximate $400,000 that we were hearing about that um, you're now having to absorb, correct? About $480,000, I think the number is that we're now, if the number holds that we will need to absorb, yes. Did you know that when you were voting that night that you might have to absorb that? Because you guys didn't, no one made a motion to make a motion to increase your budget, correct? Nobody made a motion at that time to 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 change the budget to take that to, into consideration um, based on the prior year, the time that the, the Board of Ed passed the budget and the Board of Selectmen was presented with the budget, there was a favorable turn in health insurance. So we did not want to increase the budget at that particular time, um, nor do we make any adjustments to account for the larger health insurance number. In retrospect, um, you know, the, the information that we had been given at the time about possibly the um, the state putting more money in, there were some rumors, um, ended up not coming to fruition. Um, well, the reason I'm asking that is because, you know, we, we, we get numbers on insurance all the time, and, you know, we normally go with what's before us at the time. Um, and because this becomes the problem, we start dealing with rumors of what might happen or might not happen, um, it becomes difficult. And uh, because you don't know whether these rumors are true. And in your case, it, it worked to the bad this year because um, I guess this federal funding that you had heard rumor of, I guess, as you said, was applied to this year, not, not the next year, not the fiscal year 23 number. And now we're in this bind. Um, so, um, I don't, I don't want to be a dead horse, but, you know, in the future, I think you guys have got to work with the number you have before you and not deal with rumor and, and things that you're hearing unless they're definitive, because that's the only thing you can really go with. Um, and if, I think it would have been better if you had properly budgeted the health insurance with the latest information you had had at the time, either the night before or the day, 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 day of. So that is a fair point, Mr. Walsh. At that that time, I think the board was really just trying to lower the um, the request and base, as I said, based on the year before, there was a positive turn in the health insurance number um, and wanted to be as as 
close to what we thought the budget would come into and it was going to the first select woman's office and based on the information that we had received at the time. I don't know if Ms. Laborious, you were off, if you have any other information that you want to add in terms of add some color around when we got the information about the health insurance number, if there was anyone else that you reached out to the state. Um, and at the time, the recommendation was that we were not going to make the adjustments. Yes, correct. Um, can you hear me better now? Yeah, you sound great. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. Um, yes, yeah, so the initial letter was from the controller's office. I do believe, I, I'm sorry that I didn't hear the conversation earlier. I'll just state briefly that um, we did have um, belief at the time from reading the letter and from our contact with um, Aon, our, um, the town and our consultant for health insurance, that um, that 40 million would be applied, uh, the 40 million that was received in federal funding would be applied to the premium and would reduce the, um, the health insurance premiums for the upcoming fiscal year um, that letter was then um, adjusted or corrected when we received the um, um, consultant's letter from the state saying that the proposed premiums at the time were 8%. So we thought we were being fiscally conservative with going with the 6.5%. Um, we um, found out the actual experience could be as high as 8%, but we were also advised by the carrier and by colleagues that it's still an uncertainty so we wanted to advise the board, and at the time the decision was not to make the adjustment to the budget, um, given that there's still a level of uncertainty about where um, the state will be come of the next month or two. Um, and Ms. Laborious, thank you for, for that background and, and timing. And I think what you might have also missed was, I think in the future you guys have got to just deal with the, the numbers that are before you and not deal with rumor and innuendo and hope and prayer. And I know you're trying to keep your budget down. I do. And, and I know you're trying to bring in a, a low budget if you possibly can. But, you know, this board and even the RTM, we, we, we don't change number. We only deal with actual numbers that are before us. And this board sometimes gets numbers that are show insurance are right, right at the last minute that the number is now changed and it has to go up or has to go down and we deal with the latest number, the actual latest number, um, despite the fact that we might hear that experience levels are looking great or not looking great or, or whatever, we can only deal with what's before us and then the RTM has to do the same. You know, if the RTM now a month later gets an experience number that shows that they can make a further reduction at that point in time, they do. Whether that will hold for the rest of the year, no one knows, but we can only deal with hard facts and I think um, in the future, I think your board should should think about that. I mean, I can't tell you what to do, but I think it it just you know it's got to be more hard facts. I think, but I, I understand you were dealing with Aon and whatever. So I, I it was more a question because um, it, it assumed I assumed that when you guys were talking about this four hundred eighty thousand dollars that you didn't know that like you really didn't know. You know, but I didn't, I, you know, I learned after the fact that, no, it was really discussed at the board meeting, the budget meeting, to determine your budget, and you guys decided, or the, the board decided, that they were going to ignore that and hope for the best, I guess, is the best way you could say it, and it didn't happen. So, that's it. So, that's all oh. I have on that fact, and then. Okay, let's, let's um, I'm sorry, Ms. Vitale, were you going to say something? Um, just at the time, we did find that F, the at information out about the 8% really on the night that we voted. The board had gone through a lot of deliberations about the budget and at that particular moment um, realized that given there was still some uncertainty um, and knowing that the budget was going through other town bodies, that the first select woman could reduce it um, further, that this board by the time it got to you, we would have two more months of knowledge that you could either possibly restore that money if it turned out that the 8% was holding true two months later. Um, and that is why we made the decision that we did not to alter the budget at really the 11th hour after we had really um, going under the assumption the 6% was a, a conservative number. Okay. But I will definitely take that under your advisement in the future, Mr. Walsh, for next year. I, I appreciate that because if I get information or our board gets information Thursday night that tells us we should go up or down on the insurance, I'll make the change that night. 
that's what I'm going to do. So, uh, but I appreciate you, um, your, your, your comments and I appreciate the tough position you were in. So uh, thank you very much for that. I have no more further questions on this item, um, unless other board members want to jump in. But I, after that, I'd like to go back to Ms. Laborious where I left before. Go ahead. So Ms. Laborious, I think where we last left off, and I appreciate you going jump through the hoop so we could hear you better. So, so thank you for doing that. I, and I know it's a pain, but I appreciate you doing that. Um, yeah, so you, I think we last left it. There was, you know, correct me if I'm wrong with any of my notes that I have here, that last year after various changes and seeing what happened, you were able to buy $981,000 worth of things, coolers, some other things you would, you would listed, correct? And keep it out of the budget, yes. not creating a slip, correct? Correct. Okay. So now we're now, we're now um, where we are today. I'm trying to bring us up to where we are today. Um, has the district sent out like letters or, or told families already without getting into the specifics of that or individuals. I don't want to know anything about any specific, but has the district identified the number of students that they believe need um, to have a summer program for lear learning loss for this or that's going to start like July 1st for 23? The district did start planning for the summer program. Um, the projection is that the um, number of students served this summer, I believe. Now, I don't have Dr. Parrish on the line with us today, and the, and the programming is ongoing. But from a budget perspective, it was assumed that it would be pro provided at the same levels as we did last summer. Okay. Um, do you know um, whether the number of students that you're predicting, because um, you obviously prepared, you think it's going to be the same amount, um, you, are you estimating that this, the number of students that the district believes should be in this program is about the same as last year? That's what the budget assumed. And the savings that we saw were based on some things that we could recycle that were manipulatives and other items. Um, some of the things that are consumable um, in the instructional supplies, we, we still need to purchase new, but we were able to save some of the things that we used last summer um, we um, had a higher budget for the transportation for the summer program, so that was reduced for last year and for this year, which was helped us to do the reallocation. Um, the third item was the remote aspect of the teaching um, didn't turn out to be as great. The need wasn't as great as we saw as we initially planned. So there was some savings on the remote side. We were able to do a lot of it in person, I believe, and so that's what we see. Um, some of the savings that was reapplied for some of our budget items that we mentioned earlier. So, like last year, I presume, you know, whatever the number you're presuming, you are not going to hit 100% of those students are going to take you up on your offer to come to a summer program for learning loss. You know, there's just some people who maybe it's the kids are going to other programs, maybe they're going on vacation. You know, whatever it is, you're not going to hit 100 percent, correct? Well, we do anticipate that we the need is out there for learning loss. I, I apologize. I don't want to speak for Dr. Parrish, and she isn't here. But I, I do know that we are – it was a successful program. Um, there was a lot of really great feedback. I'd invite anyone here to come to our updates um, on the summer – the BOOST program and also the after-school program as well, um, and that – it's anticipated that we will have a need at the same level that we had last year. It is not 100% of the Fairfield uh, public students, um, but we do anticipate that the need will match what we had last year. It won't be the same exact students. It'll be a different cohort potentially, Walsh, but at the same yes. level. Yes. Hi, Jeff yes. Peterson uh, of the Board of Ed. I, I do have some statistics uh, I, I was able to find uh, in, in, the, in my brief search uh, about the enrollment, the initial enrollment in June prior to the summer program. Um, the summer boost program uh, enrolled uh, had identified 186 elementary students and 79 middle school students. Um, the uh, the K through eight virtual tutoring program uh, had 96 students through in K through five and 32 students in grades five through eight. Okay, Mr. Peterson, do your numbers show like what the budget was based on? How many students coming versus how many came? 
I, I know that information is out there. We did not prepare that for this meeting and we can probably get that information to you. I, I believe we were presented with that uh, at some point in the early fall. Okay. Yeah, um, we were. And I would just to um, piggyback on Ms. Le Ms. Laborde said, we are in the process of identifying. And with this funding, you know, there is flexibility that if the program that we're running doesn't meet the needs of all students, you know, we will be entrusting staff to be looking at ways of building programming that does. You know, just with the after school program, we got a presentation a couple of weeks ago. Well, I think at our last meeting, just hearing about how it's somewhat organic um, for our middle schooler and our high school program. As they started to run the program and students are coming in, they're based on developing the program further based on student need. We're seeing increased um, executive functioning needs of our students that are coming after school and staff is responding to that. So to some extent, um, you know, there are students that have been identified already, but it is only March and the work is going to be continued. And if there's a need for students, uh, you know, we might have to readjust again. You know, plans that were made last summer, you know, continue to evolve as we move forward with this pandemic. And hopefully we're done. You know, hopefully we won't have to be worried about, um, you know, additional mitigation factors, things that we had to budget for last year, that the bulk of this can go just to transforming the district, which is what the ARP ESSER when that money came to school districts, it wasn't meant to supplant local funding. It was meant to be used to really take districts to, to the next level, to realize the trauma that students have been through these last two years, to use the money to invest in staff, build staff capacity, address you know, needs, um, address areas of learning loss. And that's what you know, that's what the board's focus has been for this money. We do appreciate that some of it was used to offset the increase for the next next budget cycle, appreciating um, you know, some of the greater needs of the town. And we did want to see where we could possibly leverage that money without creating a cliff. And as Ms. Laborie has reported, some of the, the, um, the textbook went into that and the Tomlinson roof chiller because we felt that that was an HVAC upgrade. So that would be covered by the grant money. The community outreach coordinator, that position, um, you know, I think we needed it before, but over the last two years, increased needs of our families. You heard it on the town side with increased needs at the senior center and for social services. So we put that position, not necessarily wanting to add FTE to the operating budget, put that in the grant, and you know, hopefully we'll see a positive outcomes from that position and consider whether or not we want to keep it you know in years to come but um you know student need is really driving our operating budget and it's driving how we're using our federal funding and then you can use this money again next year so if anything's not spent you can use it to follow that'll be the third and last year correct Um, no, um, next year is the, so there were three, well, four main sources of funding. There was well, what I call the COVID funding, which was the initial funding for emergency purchases like transportation and um, um, supplies, um, PPE and things like that. There was an ESSER 1, I call ESSER 2, and then the third, which was enacted by ARP, you know, um, legislation. So the ARP ESSER is the third iteration, what we're calling ESSER II, or the ESSER funding is expiring uh, September of 2024, I'm sorry, 2023. So that would be one year from this September. So we do have a year plus a little bit of tail in the following fiscal year. And then the other um, ARP ESSER has one more year beyond that. And so the current um, funding- We will be getting yeah. updates on the grant funding as part of the quarterly reports. Um, is there a reason none of, the, or maybe maybe some of it is, and you can tell me, but why some of the money has not been, or more of it, has not been spent on the increase in the special education funding that we needed because of the um, pandemic that we were explained last meeting, the meeting that we had on your budget, um, you know, because it seems to be going up because of the needs of the students. 
why none of it's been spent on, on special education funding? So the document we provided was, um, oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? I can. Okay, the document we provided um, to the town was specifically about ARP, ESSER, ESSER II, um, but there is additional funding that we can um, share. We did share it with the Board of Ed um, previously, but there's um, funding specifically dedicated to special education, IDEA ARP money, and then there's some two other um, smaller grants. Um, the IDEA ARP money has been spent 407000 this year dedicated to special education offsetting the tuition. Um, it's a total of, I think, 700000 so there's additional um, things that it's dedicated for that will be spent down this year and next year. In addition, there's some funding that was available to us for um, programs uh, to support dyslexic children with dyslexia. Um, and so there was there was money. It's just not on the report that the town asked us for initially. All right. If you can get us those figures, so so the actual special education spend for the town last year. I mean, the current year we're in, the year before that, and then this coming year is actually higher than because we're not seeing some of the spend because you're getting grant money that you're spending it on on the side. Is that correct? No. Um, Actually, the, the report that we provided that showed the special ed funding, spending did include that funding, and you'll see that in the notes for this year. Okay. So um, I always show the gross total funding. So, for example, when you see the tuition funding, it's the gross, and then the next line nets out the revenues so you can see the total impact to the Board of Ed budget. And in the special ed um, spreadsheet that I provided, and I can resend that, it did show that number for this year. So our next year projection does account for the fact that that money goes away and it's one time for this year and it does show it. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Is that it, Mr. Walsh? I, I wanna to go to the private school busing after this, but at least for the Board of Education staff. Okay. But I mean, I don't know what, who needs to stay for the private school busing. Okay. I'll leave that up to um, the representatives from the Board of Education and Fairfield Public Schools. Um, but why don't you go ahead and ask your question, Mr. Walsh? Ms. Laborious and Mr. Papa George are with us. And I think that both of them will stay on to answer any question. And Mr. Schneider is still with us as well. Okay. And Mr. Schneider of transportation, right? Yes. Jim, you're you're fading in and out a little oh, bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this better? Yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll say get a little closer. I'm sorry. I find that when I pull away a little too far, the microphone's not as good. So I will I appreciate the reminder though, Mr. Stark. Thank you. Um, so I just want to get a little bit more information on the private school bus transportation and the increase of 20.58%. I was kind of left after the last meeting thinking about it and thinking that I thought it seemed to be, and I'm not sure Ms. Laborious, whether you or someone else was explaining that. It was really based on the costs of fuel and oil and things like that. And um, I'm, I'm glad Mr. Schneider's here because I know this is his specialty. So, because when I look at the town side budget for transportation, it seems as though it says the general education and the busing assumes a 4% increase driven by a contractual increase of 2.5% and a fuel increase of more than 50% above the current rate. So um, if, you know, maybe Mr. Schneider can help me understand, are there any other other increases that are going on that are driving the private school bus transportation to go up five times more, 500% more, 
then the um, public school bus transportation is going up. Yeah, Would you like me to take this, guys? Mr. Schneider, are you here? I am here. Are. Everyone hear yes, me? Mr. Yes, we can, Mr. Schneider. Can thank you. you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, if you remember last year, we put together a proposal to uh, eliminate several buses from our budget last year at a savings of 700000 plus. I do remember some conversation about that, and I think you may have spoken about that, actually. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, a cut of five buses, which um, wound up to be a cut on the town side of eight buses. And eight. Okay. again, dealing with it, as you said, dealing with it in the moment, we did our best to make it work, but several of the schools have increased enrollment. And the routes are running well over an hour. Was, can I just ask you, um, in your professional opinion and going through, I know you probably do this on a daily basis, were you finding that the private schools were um, the buses were more empty, so you were able to cut more buses out of the out of the private school transportation, and now those kids are back, those children are back, and now uh, you're having to add more buses. Is that what you're trying to say, or, or am I not getting it correct? What I'm trying to say is that we cut the budget and the buses to where the minimum was. So when you have a school such as the Unqua School, we're only running two buses for them we split the town in half. Uh, because of their enrollment and the geographic placement of those children, we're now running because their enrollment is up slightly uh, more than an hour. Which so, is I understand that's obviously, I'm sure you're getting screamed at by parents, um, not an enviable position to be in. Um, so you're adding more buses on for not only the Uncle with School, but for other private schools, is that correct? For schools, we're putting two of the vehicles back out of the eight that were removed to service the children within the guidelines as we service everyone else in less than an hour per route. And that means that since it's gone up so dramatically on the private side, but not on the public side, that you didn't have to add as many buses on for the public school children transportation. Percentage. Uh, I know it's a lot more schools, but maybe I'm not sure you tell me. On the private side, we're more geographically put in a bad position because you have no attendance zones, whereas in our public schools, you have attendance zones. So wherever their enrollment is, it's more like an open enrollment uh, situation and the children fall all over our town, thus making our routes in excess of an hour. Mr. Schneider and Mr. Walsh, if I just might add that you do see a savings on the budget if you look back two years, because as Mr. Schneider pointed out, the reduction was eight buses. He's adding back in two, still a net reduction of six buses. But when you look at the budget to budget impact that the amount associated with the increased runs is about 128,000 of that increase. So that adding back in of those two runs for the reasons he just mentioned, I mean, those two buses. <clears throat> yeah, so, so that 128,000 on, yeah, I'm looking at the past budget. So it's, that causes a dramatic, dramatic increase. So for Correct. buses and adding to add, add two. And, that, and then if I may, on the fuel side, we're over three times the rate we paid last year the rate for fuel last year was one dollar three point three three seven, whereas now we're over four twenty five, four twenty nine. Okay, and the private school buses run as you say. You're not geographically limited, so they run greater distances. Also, is that correct? Yes. Okay, I think you've covered the answer to the question. I appreciate it. Um, thank you very much for being here. Sorry to pull you out tonight. Um, short notice. Well, thanks for having you. Didn't pull me out. We're home. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Schneider. Um, I think you have another question, though, coming. <laughs> Mr. Stark. Mr. Stark, 
Yeah, uh, Mr. Walsh is on an interesting topic. My son goes to Unqua, and uh, you know we, uh, but but we live down the street, so we we just he bikes or we drive him. But I but uh, I got to be honest, I see those buses are pretty empty, and um, and I wondered what is the town's like minimal contractual or legal responsibility to provide any busing whatsoever to the Unqua school? Because I'm new on the board and I don't know. All right. Uh, basically, we follow. We must follow like services. Okay. State statutes. Mile. Point uh, seven five elementary. Mile and a quarter and a mile for middle. And we are put it put simply. We're just required to do that. We're required, and unfortunately, uh, the populace buses. Yeah. We're required. The populace is less. The geographics is greater. Okay. Yeah. I have a kid at Uncle School, but I wish we weren't contractually required. To be honest with you, um, I'd be I'd be um, among the first to say that could go, but that's impossible. So I will shut up. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, and if I could advocate to one, just one piece. Just um, parents can opt out, um, and when they do opt out, then we we um, are able to modify those runs where the parents are able to opt out from um, from transportation if they don't yeah. need it, if they bike like Yes, <laughs> Courtney, I know that. Yes, yeah. let me most answer of that. us do. That's <laughs> the <laughs> painful thing is that we're paying for this even though most of us do opt out. Well, but we can yeah. do anything about it, so let's not worry about it. Let me just add yeah. one point. We do not service the full school. We only service the parents, the families that request the service through the schools. Yeah. So we're not just running around aimlessly with the enrollment of 200 plus students. It's only the ones that ask for and require the service by statutes. I understand. No, you, you, you do what you have to do. And, and I totally get that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Madam Chairman, I just wanted to thank you for uh, making this happen tonight. I know it was short notice, so I wanted to thank you. And I also wanted to thank um, the members of the administration and Ms. Laborious, Mr. Schneider, and and um, Ms. Vitale, Mr. Peterson for uh, the last minute for, for making yourselves available tonight. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you for acknowledging that, Mr. Walsh. I'll, I'll also throw in my thanks to Ms. Vitale and Ms. Laborious and others. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you uh, making yourselves available. So thank you again. I think you're off the hook now. <laughs> Unless Thank you. Have a, have a good say. night. You're to say. Have a good night. We Thank have an early. <laughs> and Mr. Schneider has buses too. Make sure to get on the road yeah. early tomorrow. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Schneider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So Thank you. we're going to move on to item five on the agenda, which is our public executive session and our our deliberations. And as I said at the outset of the meeting, this is. Um, just an opportunity uh, for our board members to share their thoughts on the budget as individuals. Um, one second, Mr. Sark, and uh, you know any or or, or overall, um, so we can share those thoughts. And the idea would be to sort of get them out and have whatever debates and discussions we would like to have in advance of our uh, vote on Thursday. So. Um, with that, I will turn it over to the board and whoever wants to speak. Mr. Stark, go ahead. I'll be really quick. I, I just want to um, commend the administration for um, the fiscal discipline that they've shown. You know, in the opening meeting, I fired a salvo where you didn't need to necessarily absorb inflation for the rest of us in town. But I mean, that's still admirable and uh and a great effort and I, and I think we we don't want to undermine that too much on the board of finance um it's uh it's it's good administration and, and and good budgeting and you know based on comments I've made previously your budgeting uh Jared tends to be fairly accurate so even in this period of high inflation I'm looking forward to that continuing to be true 
uh, the, all that said, I, I I will lay open my view on the education uh, budget, the two and a half million cutback. Um, I'm not really feeling that this year. I think this is a good year to just let the BOE have the request that it's asking for. I, I don't fault anyone in the administration for giving that a try. Uh, I, I don't think that's an unreasonable point of view to try to keep that in check. Um, but, but uh, yeah, but I, I am probably not going to go along with it. And that's it. Simple as that. Taking the politics out of it, just looking at the math. It's been a good process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stark. Um, other board members want to share their thoughts? Uh, Mr. Curley. Session now, right? Sure, the, thank I just want to. Sure. Uh, sorry, uh, someone else speak up. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just want to make sure we went into the executive session. The recording is it's not recording now. Oh, this is a public session, uh, Mr. Testani. Oh, public. I'm sorry. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, I apologize. Sorry. Just our, our public deliberations, executive session, meaning uh, only our board members are participating, no public comment, uh, uh, just I, us. Okay. Sorry, okay. my apologies. Okay. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Curley. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I guess it's probably fitting that Kevin and I go first as the new guys. Um, but uh, I also want to uh, commend the administration and the finance department and all the department heads who uh, were able to walk us through their budgets. I found it incredibly insightful. Um, a lot of information was gathered through the process. Uh, it's easy to put your head into a, a budget book and, and look at spreadsheets and, and get lost in the numbers. But but this process uh, brought a lot to life uh, to me uh, or for me. And I appreciate all the effort that the that the administration and, and Jared and his team uh, went through to put this together. Um, uh, in terms of um, the deliberation and debate, I'm looking forward to it, whether it's tonight, whether it's Thursday night. I'm um, happy to share my views. Uh, I have a lot of respect for this board over the years. I've been in front of this board on the other side of the table and, and many of the same cases that were here uh, then are, are still here. And I have a lot of respect for my colleagues now. Um, and I look forward to the discussion and debate. Um, I will share some thoughts as well. Uh, generally speaking, um, I did not hold back on Saturday. Um, so I think everyone, uh, um, understands my view on the uh, Board of Education budget. In terms of that, I, I know that it's important for us to not rubber stamp anything. And I feel like it's really important that we go through the due diligence. And even even like tonight, I, I'm, I'm not in favor of cutting the police department um, headcount or the overtime. Uh, what I wanted to do is understand the math that went into the numbers, because I wanted to make sure that there wasn't a double count. And I felt like the chief did a very good job of explaining that. It took a little bit of time and discussion, but that's part of the process. Um, so I'm, I'm good on stuff like that. Uh, I, I do have some views on uh, uh, our capital spending, non-recurring uh, expenses like paving, for example. I think this board has established a longstanding precedent that uh, those type of things don't get bonded. So I'm actually in support of increasing the operating expenses uh, so that the administration can uh, execute their paving plan without going through the bonding process. Um, and, and generally speaking, I think, uh, uh, and whether it's, um, uh, whether it's the board of ed side or the paving, uh, on the capital side, um, a few adjustments here or there, but overall, I thought the, the budget was, um, extremely well put together and, and I look forward to the discussion and debate. So. Thank you, Mr. Curley. Uh, Mr. DeWitt, did you have your hand up? Oh, you were just motioning. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to share their thoughts? Okay, we might be ready to go home if that's it. <laughs> Mr. Walsh. Yeah, I would just like to um, also commend the administration for bringing um, budget in that I believe covered everything and um, fully funded things. I, I, I understand the, the 2.5 
million dollar cut to the Board of Education uh, budget um, by the Board of Selectmen. Um, but I also understand that increase was 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 quite large, a ten million dollar increase. So it was just a reduction uh, of that from uh, to I think a more a reasonable amount. And I've already said it once before. I don't know if you know this will be the last, but um, if we can't bring a budget in for a one point two reduction. Uh, and can't handle that. We 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 seriously have a problem, um, and maybe that problem will be resolved in the future. But I mean, that's literally what we're talking about. So, um, uh, and I and I appreciate Mr. Curley's remarks tonight um, regarding the police. Uh, um, so, uh, in regards to you know asking your questions, and you asked some very um, uh, deliberative questions. I think that was great. I mean, and obviously you're a new member of the board. Some of us have had longer experience on other boards or whatever and hearing about their overtime and, you know, there's, there's definitely a little bit of a learning curve. You seem to be catching up quicker than, than a lot of people. So I, I tried, but I appreciate your questions. And, and sometimes some of my questions were trying to help get you to, you know, to, to, to have them explain it a little bit better because some of this stuff is just really hard to learn. It's more experience. And I can't tell you the number of mistakes that I've made in 20 years and embarrassed myself. So you didn't do that. You did a great job in, in asking you a question. So, um, uh, so I, I, I appreciate you, you saying that, but, um, overall, I think this was, uh, you know, a great budget, you know, it, it is scaring me going into an inflationary period of time. I, I will tell you that much, uh, where, where it's going to go, what's going to happen with, job markets and everything going on with all the pressures around the world and where we're going. And um, I know that there are people already struggling in this town and you to an inflation in some areas that inflation's not the 8% in some areas like fuel, it's 30% um, and whatever. And uh, I know that this, the taxpayers can use a break and, um, the number that the first selectman proposed, I was first select woman proposed, and the board of selectmen agreed on, um, I thought was uh, extremely fair. And uh, I don't want to overtax our taxpayers at this point in time. So that's all I have. I look forward to deliberating. There's some still some things I'm churning in my mind. So I look forward to talking to all of you um, who I respect on uh, Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Mr. DeWitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chris DeWitt. Uh, Mr. Curley, if um, if my comments uh, my comments were not during the police budget were not intended to in any way um, imply that you were you were looking for a reduction. So if I did, I, my my apologies. Um, I uh, I do I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I do want to reiterate my my support for the police budget in that that manpower. Uh, um, and as I said. Um, and I neglected to say on Saturday, I also want to um, uh, advocate for the social services additions. Um, you, some of you might know, you know, I'm the commander of one of the American Legion posts in town, and the social services department does great things for, for not only our seniors and our our, um, our community, but but also our veterans. And and I very much appreciate Mrs. DeMarco and uh and all her staff and and their their hard workers and to increase those positions to um to what the um the first select woman has uh has um recommended i think is is commendable uh i wanted to commend the first select woman uh change is never easy um you know this is our second or third year of you know moving a person out of this department and plugging them in here and and it feels like it's getting better, and I think the changes are are, are pretty well coordinated. I mean, we might be changing the headcount by three, but the, the overall dollars haven't changed that much independently. So um, I give her uh, a lot of credit for that. And I also want to thank our new budget director, Frank, for an, an excellent job, and I think he did a great job presenting uh, to all of us this year. 
Uh, a lot of good backup this year, a lot of backup. <laughs> and uh, Frank, you did a great job. So I think you're off screen, but um, you know, my thanks and thanks for the board. And um, I think that's it for me. Thank you for, uh, thank you for leading us to Ms. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Uh, other members who haven't spoken yet want to speak up and then we'll, Mr. Matola. Yes, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I too want to just thank the administration for all their hard work. I, I, I do think the town budget is a responsible budget and I want to thank you for that. Um, I also think the Board of Education budget is a responsible budget too, um, given what uh, has happened over the last two years. So I'm, you know, I don't, I don't know what the number is. I need to think about it a little bit more, but I'm probably inclined to restore some of that um, reduction. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna call it a cut. I think that's an unfair statement. It's a reduction. So, um, and I think that can be done in a responsible fiscal manner. Um, and so. Uh, you know, I need another day or two to think about it, and we'll chat about this all on Thursday night. But again, I want to thank Board of Education, First Selectman. Thank you very much, Brenda. Thank you, Jared, Frank, the entire department heads who came here over the last three weeks. Um, seems like these budget meetings are going longer and longer. So I think we need to have a little chat about that after the budget season, too. Um, I'm not sure why. <laughs> but. You know, People like to talk. I don't, I, 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 I All just, those new I, guy I, questions. I, yeah, but I don't know if that's the reason. But it's, I don't. I I respect all of you. I think we should be able to ask all the questions we want to ask. But I don't think it serves us as a board or the public when we're doing things at midnight or after. So we just we need to put our heads together to see uh, why. Um, that's all. Maybe because things are getting more complicated. So maybe that's the reason. But uh, thank you all. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Matola. Ms. Marmion? Okay, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Um, I just want to echo my former board members. It's it's been a good process. Um, I appreciate the first select woman's putting forth what I also view as a responsible budget. Um, and I I do have some areas that I'm interested in looking at um, making some suggested uh, changes. Um, so I look forward to talking about that on Thursday and also, as I stated on Thursday, um, I do believe that the Board of Ed budget that was put forth was responsible um, and um, really necessary given, given what the um, school district has been through in the past two years. So, um, and I appreciate all of the department heads coming forward for all of their hard work putting together this budget as well and for answering all of our questions uh, for central office, Mr. Cummings, the Board of Ed. Um, it's been a good process. It always is. It's great to hear people's questions and thoughtfulness and seriousness with which everybody takes this in terms of delivering services to the town uh, without uh, taxing uh, the residents. Um, so thanks and, uh, see you Thursday. Thank you, Ms. Marmion. Uh, Mr. Stark. Yeah. Um, just, just had a question. Mr. Mr. Walsh Robert, uh, referenced a 1.2% decrease in, and, and I was not sure what he meant. That's all. I believe he was referring to the, um, the reduction, um, Made by the uh, of the increase of the board of eds. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Is that right, Jim? That's correct. I was okay. just looking at the board of I, education I, budget and taking out the two point five on a two hundred and four million dollar budget. I understand. Okay, cool. Just wanted to make yeah. sure. Yep, Thanks. not a problem. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. Testani. Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I'm getting um, falling back on my calling point of order since you uh, you've been on for a few weeks now as chair. So thank you for leading us. As other people have mentioned, I want to also thank the first select woman. If we take a step back a little bit from when I first started on the board just a couple of years ago, the town, I'm sure of my, my colleagues who are on the board of finance with me now can remember meeting with the previous CFO before Jared, um, with the previous conservation director, with people who unfortunately, um, you know, pursued the wrong path for the town from as a result from some um, situations from the previous administration that landed us into uh, both a fill pile uh, situation where, as we know, we have to allocate millions of dollars to uh, the first select woman having to take on a pandemic. So I, and hopefully it's an endemic in the, in the phase we're in now in terms of what the town is gonna have to uh, prepare for as far as COVID. Uh, we're still, as we know, gonna be dealing with the fill pal and its ramifications for many years to come, unfortunately. So the first select woman and her administration had quite a bit to overcome in that regard and has done a phenomenal job both in handling that and this budget. And, um, you know, I want to echo some of the sentiments that, you know, Mr. Walsh expressed in terms of uh, the Board of Ed budget. It's, um, as we've sort of bantered about the, the syntax of the, the total increase in, increased in request of 10 million. The, the only thing I want to say about what transpired was I think if it had been conveyed to parents in a different way in terms of how um, the budget had been considered, it, there wouldn't have been quite uh, as much, I, I think, misunderstanding as far as what the Board of Finance's responsibilities are to the Board of Ed's total budget and where that money gets allocated, which as we know is a responsibility of the Board of Ed. So I just want to uh, sort of follow up on that a little bit and hopefully the communications will improve in the future in terms of how parents understand uh, the way the Board of Ed allocates whatever dollars it gets um, adjusted to it. So I, I do support what the first select woman and the Board of Selectmen suggested as far as their the Board of Ed's total budget. And um, think we've, I'm sure we'll, we'll all agree to pass a responsible budget that will have the least impact on Fairfield taxpayers. At least I, I, I'm gonna sign off with that positive note as we go into Thursday's meeting. So thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to work with you all. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Mr. Testani. Um, so I'll just wrap up and then I wanna give Ms. Kupchik a chance to speak as well. So first of all, I wanna thank all my colleagues again. I, I think I said this Saturday, but I, um, to, to Mr. Matola's point, I know we've been here many long nights. Um, and, you know, thank you for doing this work and, and thank you for uh, working together so diligently on this. And of course, thanks also to the administration who has um, who has worked with us through through all of this. And I'll, I'll give a special shout out to both Jared and Frank, who, um, who have put in a lot of time and effort uh, working with us through this. So I have a I have just a couple of thoughts. I'm, <clears throat> I'm sure they won't surprise anyone. I, I probably shared uh, shared some of them briefly on Saturday. Um, so first, I, I appreciate the first select women's budget, particularly on the town side. I, I think there's a lot of good initiatives in there, um, and I um, I, I support um, uh, many of them. Um, I am not comfortable with the cut to the to the Board of Education budget. I, I think, uh, and listen, I'm an accountant. I think it's easy to talk about numbers and percentages, but <clears throat> that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, children. And I, it, it's just my belief that if I just look at this really from the, the lens of fiscal responsibility, I think that shortchanging uh, our education budget this year I truly believe it will cost us more money in the long run um, from the standpoint of additional interventions 
um, and more harm. And, and, and I believe that. I believe we are in a very uh, different time than we have been uh, in any, any time in recent memory. Um, I know from, you know, personal experience with family and friends, what is going on in some of the schools. I think we listened to teachers and parents Saturday and, and that's real. So I, I think that we can get ourselves into a spiral of, uh, you know, of uh, long-term higher cost if we don't do what we need to do in terms of intervention for our schools and students now. So I don't want to get on a soapbox, but that, that's just my personal belief. So I, I do support um, restoration of the education budget. Uh, a few other things. I, um, we talked about paving. I very much support uh, reinstating the paving budget to a level that is in, in our operating budget, that's a level that we um, not only have had historically of about $2 million, but that is um, consistent, that $2 million is consistent with what we've been advised is sort of the long-term run rate after we do all the catch up. And so I, I, I think that's a responsible thing to do. Um, so I'm, I'll just leave it at that. I, I don't, um, I don't believe in, in bonding, you know, recurring capital like paving. I think I've said that before, so I don't need to repeat it, but I'm just putting that out there because I believe that we, um, you know, it's one of those things that's easy to cut, it's hard to put back, um, but I do think we should have that in our budget this year. Um, and then I would just suggest, um, and I, I understand Mr. Walsh's point about if we can't find 1.2% in the education budget, kind of what the heck are we doing? But I, I think that's a hard thing to do. I mean, you know, listen, on the town side of the budget, that would equate to, I don't know, a million and a half dollars of savings to find. You know, that's not an easy thing to do when you have to start driving down to the line item. Level. So I think it's, it's um, you know, I, I think the needs are there. And so I, you know, I don't, it sounds reasonable when you talk about percentages, but I'm not sure it's as easy as uh, as we make it sound. So I'll just say that. Um, you know, and and you know, there are probably some other items that uh, that we can talk about um, at Thursday's meeting. But broadly, you know, I think that we had some we have some good things going in our direction this year. You know, we're able to make some of these investments in the town because we have substantial growth in our grand list. That's a great thing. We've got people coming into town. You know, we're expanding our tax base. This is good. Um, and so when you, have, when you have this type of situation, when we have an expanding grand list, when we have extra state aid that we got this year, when we have, you know, we're looking at lower debt service costs because we've paid off bonds. You know, these are times when you know, you can take the opportunity to make some important investments that that at other times might be, you know, somewhat tougher to do and still keep a, a you know, a level of uh, tax that's reasonable. So that's sort of my broad thoughts about the budget. And again, I'm sure that's no surprise to anyone since I've stated a lot of these things before. But once again, I do appreciate all of you and thank you um, for all the work and thank you for, um, you know, supporting me as I went through my own learning curve as your chair, and uh, I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, so with that, um, Ms., uh, first select woman is standing there patiently, and Ms. Kupchik, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and um, I do uh, appreciate everyone's comments, and I do appreciate the kind words uh, for myself and for my administration, and I too uh, respect the work that Jared and Frank and my CAO and Chief of Staff have done over these many, many months, uh, way back before uh, the town bodies got involved, crafting, working, erasing, fixing, and, and making sure we came in with a clean budget. And, um, you know, and to the point about, um, you know, reducing a budget or having a lean budget, you know, that takes a lot of hard work and effort. And there was a lot of things um, we would have liked to have done on the town side as well. And we really sharpened our pencil. 
and made sure that we were doing um, doing the best we could for for our community, providing the top level services, but for the lowest possible cost. Uh, to the point about inflation, it is it is a real thing for us all to be very concerned about. Um, while I understand um, we're, we've talked a lot about us uh, restoring, or some, some members have talked about restoring the education budget, I just want to say that when I crafted uh, the town side budget and the uh, Board of Education administration came in and gave me the number that they were uh, suggesting, and I told the superintendent and the board chairwoman and vice chairman that number was just too big. Um, and this is coming from someone who actually served on the Board of Education for six years. So I, I actually have um, demonstrated a commitment to education um, and have cared very greatly and deeply about that. This was, in my opinion, the largest requested increase by the education system ever. And frankly, the $2 million reduction that I am Included in their budget, in my budget last year on the education side, um, was met with the same sort of um, concern, and and they ended up with a with a two hundred or two hundred and fifty thousand dollars surplus. So there are ways to manage budgets without hurting children or having in, any impact on them. I know it because I served on the board of education and were in those meetings for six years where you would make changes that didn't impact the classroom. It can be done and it should be done. And, and honestly, I feel like, um, and I, I feel like I'm the bad guy because I'm the one who has to actually do this stuff. Um, and it's not an easy position to be in, but when you're leading a town of 61,000 people and there's a lot of, lot of different diverse financial incomes in this community, you have to take it all into consideration. So um, I have, I have um, sincerely asked our, our education officials to just go back and look. And in last year's budget, when we went and my CAO went and looked at purchasing and made some calls and did some homework, was able to save a significant amount of money on just purchasing items that didn't impact any classroom or hurt any child. And all I'm saying is that unless the town really makes the school district do that kind of due diligence on every single item, we're never really going to get these costs under control. And I'm trying really hard on the town side to do those same things, um, have more modernized, efficient um, uh, positions folding positions into others and having someone do two positions instead of one, eliminating a full-time position that really was only a part-time job, and these kinds of things, right? And they're not easy and they're hard to do. And so uh, I just would hope that the board really take a hard look um, of what the impact of adding that entire amount back in and where that money would come from. And so I... I know this is an easy work. Um, it, it's not easy, uh, but again, I think um, it's important that we really look at the big picture and we look at the, the tax increase on our residents. Um, I have tried so hard to make sure we don't have larger than a 1% tax increase in our town, and that was no easy trick. Um, the first year, we all agreed on a zero because we wanted to help our community. We had no idea what the heck was coming down at us with COVID, and it was, la it was a lot less worse than we all imagined, but then we had not funded our long-term liabilities, and that second year, we came back, and we had, and I did what everyone asked, and funded those liabilities, and still came in at a very reasonable tax, um, tax rate for our community. And so, again, we tried that again. We worked hard to make sure it was under 1%, and so what I'm asking is that um, the Board of Finance really look closely at the overall picture. And um, please uh, reach out to us before Thursday, you know, so if there are some ideas that you're going to make so that we can be prepared to answer questions, if you're uh, looking at a reduction of some kind or you're wanting to make some change, so that we're prepared to be able to answer that 
that we have the appropriate department head uh, available to uh, discuss an item if you're going to uh, change something and that of that nature. I would just uh, uh, request that courtesy uh, from the Board of Finance to the administration. And um, with that, Madam Chairwoman, um, thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, seeing you all Thursday evening. Okay, uh, absolutely. And we will certainly, um... We will certainly communicate with you, um, as I as I hope you know. All right, everyone. Um, anything else? Okay. All right. Everyone's favorite time. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Mr. Walsh. God, don't, everyone went. <laughs> Mr. Walsh seconded by everyone. Seconded by Mr. Curley. All in favor? All right. It's unanimous. Good night, everyone. Good, good night. night. Have a good night. night. Good night.